Church, we're so glad you joined us today. We are in week two of our series, Not Today, Satan, where we continue to find victory over the enemy and resolve in Jesus. We will be partnering with the Food Bank and EMP to distribute food boxes to people in our community, and we would love for you to help. We're going to be at Lane Elementary on February 12th from 2.30 to 4.30. If you'd like to volunteer, just send us an email or a message, and we can get you all the details. Thank you so much for partnering with us as we serve our community. Super Bowl Sunday is almost here, and Sunday, February 7th, is Super Sunday at Prodigal. We have an exciting online service to get you ready for the big game. We also have a fun drive through hangout plan for that morning, so come see us at Fort Washington Elementary at 10 a.m., enjoy some treats, and celebrate game day. We will also have our PC Kids bags ready for pickup. So don't forget, wear your jerseys, whether it's online or at our drive through If you're newer to our church, you may not know, but our pastor is a huge Chiefs fan. And by Chiefs fan, I mean a Patrick Mahomes fan. Like he only eats red and yellow Skittles because those are Patrick Mahomes jersey colors. He almost changed his son's name to Patrick Mahomes. And then he almost changed his daughter's name to Patricia Mahomes. So all of us here, for the sake of our sanity, we're cheering for the Kansas City Chiefs. And if you're not and you're cheering for the Bucks, that is okay. There is room in God's house for heretics. We can't wait for Super Sunday. We will see you at Fort Washington. Enjoy game day. As always, you can give to Prodigal either on our app or on our website. Also, our 2020 giving statements have already been sent out. If you didn't get one, send us an email at prodigalchurchfresno at gmail.com and we will get one out to you right away. Thanks for being so generous. We are so glad you could join us today. Now let's go worship together. I'm walking around these walls And I thought by now they'd fall but you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's won For you have never failed me yet Promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Faithfulness I'm still in your hands This is my confidence You never fail me yet Sing Jesus. Jesus, you're still enough. Keep me within your love. My heart will sing your praise again. Promise still stands. Great is your
Everybody likes football, um, but many of you know that my favorite football team is the Kansas City Chiefs, and they are in the Super Bowl playing a week from today. And I've got my Patrick Mahomes Royals jersey on. Some of you guys might be thinking, uh, Royals? Isn't that a baseball team? Yes, but Mahomes is is part owner of the Royals, and so this is a Mahomes Royals jersey, um, courtesy of Rob Stucker. Thanks, Rob. You're the man. Hope you're having a good time in Vegas. Uh, we've got Super Sunday next week, and so we've got a lot of fun elements that we're going to be having uh, for our service. It's also the finale of our Not Today Satan sermon series, and today we're going to look at week two as we continue this journey through this sermon series, looking at the spiritual and cosmic battle that happens all around us, whether we see it or not. Now, suppose a family was going to go on vacation to a beautiful cabin um, on a beach in a beautiful foreign country. And they go on this vacation and they're so excited uh, to just kind of tune out the world's problems, just relax, focus in on themselves, um, indulge themselves, right? This is what we do on vacation. Now, imagine that this place that the family goes to visit was a cabin on Normandy Beach and the date was June 5th, 1944. They would not have known that the very next day was going to be center stage for one of the most pivotal and deadliest battles in World War II. Uh, imagine the family waking up the next morning to the sound of gunfire and bombs and a U.S. captain uh, knocking on the door saying, please let us in, there's an emergency. We, we need to use this place for medical supplies and to help heal our wounded soldiers. We need your help. And then the family like, whoa, 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 we're on vacation, <laughs> okay? Uh, we're here to tune out the distractions of the world, the problems of the world, okay? We're here to do us. So if you could take your men and your little soldiers back to the beach, we're going to just chill and relax. While that attitude is perfectly acceptable on June 5th, 1944, it, became, it becomes utterly unacceptable on June 6th. Why? Because they're in the middle of a battle. It, it changes things, right? When you're caught in the crossfire of war, it changes our attitude, posture, response, and how we live. And this analogy applies to those of us who live in America who have committed ourselves to follow Jesus. Uh, most in our culture have bought into this vacation mindset, right? That, that it's the American dream, that we are entitled and we should do everything in our power to live with as much 
comfort and luxuries as possible. Enjoy the good life. We have been indoctrinated to crave that as much as possible, to acquire as many possessions as we can, to avoid all unnecessary inconveniences. And let's do us. In short, we're socialized into viewing our life as though we are on vacation, when in fact, we are in a war. As followers of Jesus, we are to understand that the earth has become a cosmic conflict, just like Normandy Beach, June 6th, 1944. And we are called to play an important role into how this battle unfolds. We are called to set aside our vacation attitude and embrace the mindset of a soldier who understands that our sole call is to please our commanding officer and do his bidding. As Paul wrote, no one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Do we ignore biblical teaching about this cosmic conflict because it upsets our Western vacation mindset? Or perhaps uh, this outlook of the supernatural bothers us because it's hard for us to take Satan, angels, and demons seriously. I think it's more the former than the latter. I think we're more bothered that it upsets our vacation mindset than we are about questioning the supernatural. We said this last week that there is always something we can't see influencing something that we can see. That there's this battle between good and evil and both forces want to take over the earth. They, get to, they have to go through us. They have to go through people. They have to go through me. They have to go through you. Check out this awesome verse in Romans, Romans 6. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. Now we could spend the whole morning on just one of those truths, but let's focus it on verse 13. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness. Now, this word instrument here in Greek is hoplon, and it's the same word used for weapon. Do not offer yourselves as a weapon of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument, hoplon, as a weapon of righteousness. Remember that guy in high school who uh, always corrected you when you, call, when you call his arms arms? He said, no, 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 they're not arms, they're guns. Okay. Maybe he was onto something because our, our bodies are weapons and they can be weapons of righteousness and they can be weapons of wickedness. When you go to work, you can be a weapon of righteousness that makes a difference in the spiritual battle. You can be honest instead of cheating. You can uh, tell the truth instead of lying. You can treat someone with dignity instead of with enmity. You're praying instead of cursing. You're forgiving instead of seeking revenge. You are a walking, talking weapon for the kingdom of Christ. You are making a difference in an epic war between good and evil. You are a weapon of righteousness. And actually, if you're watching this online with someone else, you can look to them and say, you are a weapon of righteousness. That is a biblical truth. Are we going about our lives advancing the kingdom of God, being weapons of righteousness? Or are we being weapons of wickedness? And it's, it's hard for us to recognize that we are always on the front lines because we're often lulled to sleep by just the everyday, the normal. We forget there's a battle. Lucas Sabanda, a South African man, was walking um, to his home uh, from another village and he heard something in the grass and he froze and it was a huge python. And before he could even shout or scream for help, it had constricted him. 
in pythons, they will wrap themselves around someone and completely suffocate them. Sabanda didn't know what to do. In an interview in the new local newspaper not long after, uh, he describes, I didn't know what to do, and so all I knew was I could bite right at his neck. And so he bit, he pushed, he scraped, he clawed, he chewed, he sprung himself free with a deep wound into the python's neck. Then he killed him, took him home, and skinned him and ate him for dinner. Wow. Wow. The fight that it took, everything inside of him to fight against this force that was constricting him, that was constricting his life. The, the Bible says that the enemy had comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And that is what this python was doing to him. He did everything in his power to overcome him. We too, as followers of Jesus, can do that and should do that. We gotta fight evil with the same tenacity. The stakes are high. Now, I know some... At this point, some might be thinking, well, this is getting a little too supernatural for me. Cosmic conflict, angels, demons, Satan, it doesn't really sound reasonable. It sounds a little bit superstitious and maybe even archaic. And I just want to let you guys know, I get it. Okay, me too. But there are two things that have kept me believing in this reality. Uh, the first is Jesus himself believed in this reality. It believed, he believed it was real. See, we don't just have Paul's uh, Ephesians chapter 6 that, the, that uh, we fight against in, the demons and the principalities and the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We don't just have that. We also have Jesus, who was a walking, talking, uh, spiritual rebuke to the supernatural evil that surrounds us. He's always casting out demons, nearly on every page of the Gospels. He confronts the demonic. He teaches about binding up the strong man and how to overcome the enemy. So my first reason to think that this is reasonable is because Jesus believed it was real. And my second is from my own experience. I have seen some things. I have experienced some things. I could tell you some pretty crazy stories, but at the end of the day, haven't we all experienced the supernatural battle that happens within all of us? Haven't we all experienced that lull, that pull from the dark side and also from the kingdom of light? Haven't we all been wounded in this battle? Now, I want to give us a few practical principles in regard to this cosmic conflict. And this list is by no way exhaustive. We're gonna tackle some even more in the finale next week. But number one is this, there is power in the name of Jesus. Every night, Sarah and I pray with our kids and it's, it's nothing elaborate. Um, we're not quoting a bunch of scriptures and, and praying um, you know, in the King James Version or anything like that. Uh, they're really simple prayers and my daughter's three now and when we pray at night, um, she's just kind of learning a little bit about how to talk to God and things like that. And so um, each night, I kind of thank God for some of the great special qualities that my daughter has and Ivy loves it. And so I say, dear God, thank you so much for how pretty Ivy is. And she smiles really big. And how great of a singer and songwriter Ivy is. And she laughs a little bit more. And it's great, she smiles. And in every prayer, we always end with six words. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, why? Because the song is true, he really is the name above all names. We have authority in Christ. Often, we get scared of the enemy, right? First Peter says that the devil, uh, you're, you're the adversary of your souls, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Prowls around. A lion's roar paralyzes its prey in fear. That's what the enemy uses. He uses fear to paralyze us, to freeze us. And we might be scared. We might start talking about spiritual warfare and we get scared about the supernatural evil. And I won't let you know you don't need to be scared. Uh, be, why? Uh, picture the enemy and supernatural evil like a six-ton semi-truck coming at us. It's going to get us. How can you, little old you, okay, how could you stop this semi going super fast right at you? Well, I know someone who can. Um, and they wear a little badge just right here. And if they were to stick their hand out, that, that, that semi 
that is, that is moving towards you will halt. Why? Well, a police officer can easily stop that semi because of authority. Because that officer, no matter how big or how small or how physically powerful or not powerful they are, they can stop that semi from crushing people because of their authority. And because of the authority that we have in Jesus, we can stop the attacks of the enemy. We talked about this last week. We'll talk about it again next week. But you have authority in Christ. There is power in Jesus' name. Number two, no temptation is too strong. No temptations. They, we can overcome all of them. You can overcome your temptations. Look at what 1 Corinthians says. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. There's always a way out. One of the great temptations that the enemy has on us every day is that we focus in on Jesus as being Savior and not being on Lord. We might call him Lord and Savior. In the New Testament, Jesus is called Lord 600 times, and he's called Savior about 12. And even then, it's often Lord and Savior. Savior is secondary to his lordship. The first century church had this creed, this, this belief that was, that was told, and that was, that was a conviction. And that those, the three-word creed was this, Jesus is Lord. It wasn't Jesus as Savior. It wasn't savior of my soul. It was Jesus is Lord. He's master. Intr introducing Jesus as savior without the Lord is like me introducing my wife as, hey, this is Sarah. She's my cook. When in fact, she's everything to me. There's a pastor in the 1990s who would take radio calls and prayer requests from people and, um, and so one time he gets this call from a guy and, and, the, and the guy says, hey, pastor, I know that you are a guy who believes in prayer. And the pastor says, yes, I do. And he says, I know that you, you love people, you care for people. And he says, yes, that's, that's true. And he says, well, I, I want you to pray for me. Um, and I feel bad asking you, because, but, but my pastor won't, he said he won't do it. He won't pray for me about this one thing. And he goes, okay, well, what can I pray for you about? And he says, well, I know it's gonna, I know it's gonna sound weird, but I'm in love with my best friend's wife and she's in love with me. And we want you to pray that God be able to bring us together, that we would be able to get married and that our church would accept us. Now the pastor froze and thousands of thoughts and rebukes came into his mind. And as one was about ready to leave his lips, he held back. He said, well, if the man's pastor wasn't able to convince him of something, how can I do this over the radio? And so he, didn't, he realized that he didn't need to chastise him. He didn't need to rebuke him. He needed to pray for him. And so the pastor prayed silently for a moment, Lord, what should I do? And he said uh, to, the, to the man who called for prayer, he said, sure, I, I will pray for you. Um, what is your name and, and those involved? Well, I'm, I'm Jean, Sh she's Gloria, and our best, my best friend is Mark. And he says, okay, Jean, bow your heads, let's pray. And he says, God, you know Gene's heart and his desire to be with Gloria. And they want him to take the place as her husband instead of Mark. And so, God, I pray that you would kill Mark. And immediately the man says, whoa, whoa, pastor, no, no, I, I, I don't want you to kill him. Don't you have any compassion? What kind of person would pray for God to kill Mark? Don't you have any compassion or kindness? And the pastor says, kindness, compassion, you want this man's, your best friend's wife, to leave him for you. And you're asking me about compassion? Now, before the man, uh, before the pastor could finish what he was saying, the man hung up so speedily. We often want supernatural intervention in our temptations or some kind of justification. And we often will try and find that justification in God. But God has already given us the capacity to play it forward. Hear that, church. God has given us the capacity to play it forward. Play it forward. If I make this decision, what will it get me in the end? How will it work out for those that I love, those that I care about, and for my own life? 
Play it forward. God gives us this capacity. This is a supernatural weapon that God gives us to play it forward so that we don't make that decision, that we don't fall for that temptation, that we see that there is a hook inside that worm and I'm not going to bite. The justifications never work out in the end. It is, in fact, not God's will for those things to happen, for us to do those things. It is our flesh and our selfishness that's to blame. And God will never condone our selfishness because it is completely antithetical to love. If you are longing for something and ask God, and God to bless you with something, and it is inherently selfish, and it wounds others to bless you, that's not God, because that's not love. Number three, submit yourselves to God. James 5 says this, submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. It sounds simple enough, but easier said than done, right? Now, one of my great heroes of the faith is C.S. Lewis. And C.S. Lewis was so ahead of his time, and he wrote actually during the time of World War II. And he wrote uh, not just nonfiction, but fiction. And in the Chronicles of Narnia, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, there we are introduced to a character named Eustace. And he is precocious and self-absorbed. And when he and his cousins are magically transported in the middle of this sea in the world of Narnia, Eustace is not pleased. They end up being rescued by Prince Caspian and uh, they start to uncover the mystery of some missing kings. And as the story progresses, the ship's crew stops at a mysterious island along the journey. Eustace, being Eustace, wanders from the campsite to avoid helping. And he wanders the island alone and he catches the glint of the sun uh, on something shiny and he sees a cave. And when he explores it, he finds, he finds this beautiful, gorgeous treasure filled with gold coins, silver goblets, precious jewels. Eustace is rich. And he immediately determines that what he has found is his and it is his alone. He found it first. What he does not realize is the treasure is cursed. And anyone who takes it is doomed to a magical transformation. He awakes in the cave the next morning and he's frightened by the sound of a fire-breathing dragon. He flees the cave and rushes back towards the camp. And when he gets there, the cousins and the crew don't recognize him because he himself is the dragon. Everyone flees and Eustace is alone. The story goes on to tell how he sits down in front of a pond and stares at his reflection in the water and he begins to reason that there is still a boy under all those scales. So he digs his dragon's claws under the scales as deep as he can and he peels the skin back and it hurts so terribly. And when he can't stand the pain no longer, he looks at his progress and before him is only a dragon now only bigger than before. And the more he tore away the scales, the more the cycle and the dragon increased inside of him. Selfishness does that to us. We cannot overcome our sin on our own. James tells us this, submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. We love the last part. Resist the devil, he'll flee from you. Peace, get out of here, Satan, be gone. No, 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 no. We forget the first part. Submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Our submission to God has a direct connection with the devil fleeing from us. Number four, only through Christ can we overcome the addictions, strongholds, and struggles in our lives. There will always be addictions, struggles, and strongholds. We can't avoid them, but we can overcome them. I, I would say that many of us have tried, I venture to say all of us have tried to overcome our struggles, our shortcomings, our sins, our temptations, our failures. We have tried to, to overcome them on our own. How'd that work out? No, we must uh, not build ourselves up to overcome these temptations. No, 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 it's not about building ourselves. It's about dying to self and allowing Christ within us. We lay everything at him, his feet. And that's my encouragement, our prayer for you this week, that 
that yes, we work hard, that we work hard with, to not put ourselves in these situations, to not uh, fall into these temptations, to, to play it forward so that we don't make these bad decisions, but at the end of the day, to rely on Christ's strength to overcome the enemy because we have authority in him. It's not on our own. It's not by our own strength. That we are weak, he is strong, that his strength is made perfect in our weakness, and that is how we should follow Jesus and to overcome the enemy in the adversary of our souls. When I was in Malawi, Africa in 2000, I met some of the most amazing and godly and Christ-centered people I've ever met. I'm still friends with them this day. Um, I think of uh, Raphael Zamaquecha um, in Kenya. I think of Mike Fred and his wife Elubi in um, Chawaya Village in Malawi, Africa. I think of Patrick Malemba. And I remember speaking with Patrick Malemba and uh, we were talking about struggles. I was 19 and, and uh, I, talking about struggles that you have back in California and, and he was talking about struggles that he has here in Malawi and, and he said this, he said, whenever the devil knocks at the door, I let Jesus answer. Ah, oh, man, that's so true. So this week, when the devil knocks at your door, would you too let Jesus answer? God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we have victory in you. And God, we pray in Jesus' name that you would help us to submit ourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let the devil know not today.